Good morning, everyone. Welcome to UCSD Health COVID Grand Rounds from San Diego. I'm Chip Schooley with my co-host, Chris Longhurst. And we're uh, glad to welcome you today to another in our series. Uh, please, uh, when you're ready to ask questions toward the end, you'll see a Minty code and the answer in the uh, along the bottom of your YouTube feed that will let you send in questions uh, and comments. So let me turn this over now to the Chief Medical Officer at UCSD Health, uh, Patty Mason. Thanks, Chip. Hi, I'm Patty Mason, Chief Executive Officer of UC San Diego Health System. And, you know, I, I come to this ground rounds today with uh, a heart full of gratitude for the incredible work that our teams have done. So we have been involved with COVID now for 194 days, not that we're counting. Um, but it was 194 days ago that the first planes arrived from Wuhan and we took our first pace, patients. And uh, we set up our incident command center and began to do this work. Um, and it has been an incredible journey so far. And I couldn't be more pleased and grateful for the four individuals that you're gonna hear from today um, to talk about the views from the front line, their experiences of, of how we've managed through this pandemic uh, for this last six months or so. So today you're gonna to hear from Dr. Chris Kane, our Dean of Clinical Affairs and our CEO of UC San Diego Health Physician Group. Uh, Michelle Ritter, our infectious disease specialist who has been single-handedly running our outpatient COVID clinics. Uh, Dr. Daniel Sweeney, our Hillcrest Hospital uh, Medical Director for the ICU. Dr. Sweeney has been leading the efforts for our critically ill COVID patients really since the very beginning. And then our very special Katie Moss, our, uh, our nurse representative who will give you a sense of what it's like to be a nurse on the front line. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Longhurst to, to kick this show off. Okay, Dr. Kane, you're up. All right, thank you, Patty. Uh, let me share a screen. And it's such an honor and a pleasure to be with you all today. So as Patty mentioned, our journey uh, started back in February. And I think we would all acknowledge that the fact that we got six patients uh, who were evacuated from the Wuhan uh, aircraft that landed at MCAS Miramar, those six patients cared for at Hillcrest uh, really uh, started the journey of UCSD Health, understanding uh, about what was to come with the pandemic and how we were going to uh, need to begin caring for patients, everything from uh, PPE to medical processes. And so we really felt like we got a head start uh, on the rest of the community. You may remember that it was March 13th when uh, basically the economy was, was shut down. So we had about a six week head start. And as Patty mentioned, the I. PCE team and the emergency preparedness team put together an incident command center with a series of all of the affected experts. And that's everybody from the pharmacy team to facilities to, of course, our medical care teams, uh, trying to understand what was the optimal care of these patients. And you may remember at that time, we weren't quite sure about uh, respiratory versus uh, different forms of uh, isolation. So all of this was, was a time of, of really discovery uh, for the care of these patients in the United States. And I, I'm just gonna talk about uh, some of the organizational response and not specifically about individual healthcare. We'll leave that to Dr. Sweeney and Dr. Ritter and, and, and critical care nurse Moss. But from an organizational response perspective, we had to rally the resources of the team to respond to the day-to-day -day needs of these patients, to the county, and to our region. And this is just a view of the Hillcrest Incident Command Center. Some of the unsung heroes who made an enormous impact, uh, Brad Ulay, our procurement officer, uh, acquired PPE for us. And really PPE has never been an issue for UC San Diego Health. We really led academic medical centers in California with top uh, PPE acquisition based on Brad and his team. Chuck Daniels and the pharmacy therapeutics team. Uh, you know, we have always been able to 
obtain remdesivir once it was indicated for, for treatment. And I think Dan may mention that 84 of our patients have been treated with remdesivir, even though there were widespread shortages across California and nationally, Chuck and his team have really been on the front lines. And again, um, as is our uh, culture here at UCSD, we've published much of this experience. This is a publication recently of uh, one of the experience of one of those patients. And this is uh, the tiered management system that we put into place really in response uh, to this. This is the ambulatory huddle, figuring out how we should manage uh, things in the ambulatory environment. Of course, we have 65 clinics that we shut down on March 13th and subsequently turned back on in, in, uh, in June. And that requires the work of hundreds of talented staff we're meeting every day dealing uh, with the detailed issues really led by Brendan Kramer, pictured there smiling as usual. And that's the incident uh, command center at Hillcrest tracking our PPE, what surge phase, phase we're in, how many patients are intubated, how many patients are in different sites, uh, uh, where the transfer is coming from. And again, because I'm recognizing some individuals, I, rec I realize that I'm gonna miss a number of individuals. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of teams. So if I don't mention you and your team this morning, I apologize, but in my brief remarks, um, I, uh, you know, I, I can't be uh, uh, complete with the hundreds of people who've, who've helped manage uh, our response. And then every day we uh, bring all of the information that's gathered across the organization and make sure that Patty hears it. And I would say one of the things that's been striking about this entire experience is how much UC San Diego Health has led our region. And I would say that uh, Patty and our IPCE team have really helped lead the county's response. And this shows Randy Taplitz uh, with a media experience. And I think Francesca Toriani has been on every day. Uh, it seems like she's, uh, she's on 20 hours a day. And now Dr. Avalos and Frank Myers. Uh, but I would say, uh, that Patty has really not just led UC San Diego Health's response, but has really been a leader for the county and the region. I think the other thing that we did is, is realize that our staff and our faculty um, are very anxious about the crisis that this represents for them personally and their practices. And I think our communications change dramatically for the better. And this will be one of the takeaways from this experience is our improved communication. Um, the physician newsletter that you see uh, has now been sent 60 times. It's one of the most open email communications that we send. It has an open rate of over 60% and a reread rate over 100%. The chief and chair huddles that Dr. Garfin and Patty have organized for uh, the leaders of each of our academic programs. We've now had 29 of our leadership huddles. And Patty has gotten together almost on a weekly basis for employee town halls. We'll routinely have three to 5,000 employees on the line for those town halls, getting updates, everything from medical recommendations to their HR processes. And although uh, Chris is one of our sponsors of this COVID Grand Rounds, and it appears I'm pandering, I, I have to say that the other real transformation is the IT dashboards that we've all been using organizationally. They've really transformed our organization's alignment and transparency. We get daily dashboards about uh, the patients in the hospital, the COVID patients, our testing, our PPE. Um, and when we returned to full activity in the ambulatory and surgical environment, we're tracking carefully when is the right time to back off if we need to in order to make sure we're prepared to care for COVID patients. So I don't want to miss our emergency room, our hospitalist team, and our critical care teams who all prepared for the surge that we believe may come. Remember that in May, we believed that we would be experiencing something like New York. Now, for, fortunately, we'd never experienced the dramatic surge that we were ready for, but large teams of faculty and staff prepared for the surges. And I, I felt very confident that we were prepared to care for hundreds of patients, should that be our responsibility. And I, I wanna just recognize the leaders who've set up our therapeutic teams, the critical care leaders led by Jess Mandel and Navaz Karanja meet frequently to talk about critical care algorithms, the therapeutics team led by Chip Schooley, make sure that 
the therapeutics that are important and appropriate are available for our patients and those that are not, um, uh, that we don't provide care that's uh, not evidence-based. Dr. Connie Benson runs a clinical trials uh, committee that makes sure that the most important clinical trials nationally are available for our patients. And now Dr. Susan Little is leading our vaccine trials. And I think all of us are eager to participate and support Dr. Little's vaccine trials that we hope will transform uh, national response. And finally, I just want to acknowledge what I think has been really a leading a part of UCSD Health's response, and that's been our testing. And those of us who have experience at other academic medical centers and are talking to colleagues around the country, I think this is really leading. And David Pride, who is our director of testing, uh, has really led what I think is, is the best response of academic medical center concerning testing that I've seen. And I just note there, and we've now done nearly 70,000 PCR tests. Um, and I want to acknowledge the resulting team. We do between 600 and 1,000 a day. Every single patient gets a result within 24 hours. Every positive gets a phone call, a follow-up, and care coordination and contact tracing. All of that work is coordinated by Tyson Ikeda, Chris Henderson, and the ambulatory testing team. So with, without further ado, let's transition to uh, what happens when a patient is positive and who cares for that patient uh, if they come back positive. And I wanna turn it over to Dr. Uh, Michelle Ritter. Dr. Ritter. Thank you so much, uh, Chris. Let me just make sure I'm here. Okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm Dr. Michelle Ritter. I'm one of the infectious disease doctors and I've had the pleasure of being the director of the COVID-19 infectious disease clinic. So. I am so grateful to have the opportunity to talk to everyone today about this clinic because this truly has been one of the most rewarding things I have done in my career and, and what a team to be a part of. So the idea from this clinic um, really started in March. I had a friend call me and she said her former grad student was in Michigan and had symptoms of COVID and she was frightened and, and, and she wanted to know if I could give her a call. So I called her up. And like many patients at that time, she couldn't get a test. There weren't enough tests available. She called her primary care physician. They said, don't come to the clinic, um, just stay home. And they said, just go to the hospital if you're having life-threatening symptoms. So it was a very scary time for patients who had symptoms of COVID. So I just called her and we talked about her symptoms and I tried to give her some reassurance and I gave her my cell phone number and said to call me if she had any problems. And the next day she sent me this text message. And what struck me was that um, with as little as I did for her, really just made a phone call, how it, it made her feel safer in her recovery from COVID. So I thought, gosh, this would be wonderful to do for all of our patients recovering from COVID-19 at home. So I sent an email to the administration at UCSD and within 24 hours, the ball was rolling. The first thing I realized was that Tyson Ikeda, Marlene Millen, Desiree Latham, and the whole COVID ambulatory testing team was already doing a lot of what I envisioned. So their system is that if a patient tests through UCSD for COVID-19, their team of wonderful nurses uh, call the patients to let them know if they've tested negative. And then also if they've tested positive, and if so, they go through quarantine measures, explain to them what to expect, and then they call them daily. So all positive patients tested through UCSD were getting daily phone calls from a nurse. Um, in addition, any patient who was pregnant was being called daily from the OB team. So already UCSD had a great system in place, but I suggested that perhaps um, we infectious disease physicians could start seeing patients who tested positive and do consultations on them. And then our nurse would call them daily. So we came up with this great system where we had positive patients referred to us. Um, our ID physicians would see them through telemedicine visits and then our nurse would call them. If for some reason a patient didn't get seen in our clinic, they still would be called by the ambulatory COVID team, which meant that every patient who tested positive through UCSD would have someone calling them daily, um, whether they were a UCSD patient originally or not. So I think that's really special that we had this service for patients. So our COVID-19 clinic, the way visits generally go is the first thing we do when we talk to a patient is we listen to their story. 
So we ask, you know, what, how, when did you start feeling sick? What symptoms have you had? Um, how severe have these symptoms been? So we go through that. We talk to them about um, who else is sick in their family or their household. Um, and then also go through things such as supportive care. What can they do to feel better? And generally the medications we talk about are things like acetaminophen, ibuprofen, cough medications, sometimes inhalers. We, we find that we tend to prescribe inhalers, especially in cases where a cough is, is fairly persistent. Um, we see a lot of post viral cough syndrome in these patients. We always review isolation and quarantine practices for them and their families. Um, we review emergency room precautions, tell them if they feel short of breath or have lethargy. We let them know when it's okay, to, when it's time to maybe go to the emergency room. And we like to reassure them that it's okay to go too, because there's a lot of fear of even going to the hospital. And then we answer their questions. And there tend to be a lot of questions um, and, and we're so happy to answer them. Some of the questions are regarding research and that's the one neat thing about this clinic is we've been able to um, collect patient, a patient base that can be used for possible research studies. And a lot of our patients are very interested in giving back after they've recovered from COVID-19. So one question you could ask is, why do infectious disease doctors need to be seeing these patients? Um, as you notice on the last slide, we are not prescribing any antimicrobials. Generally, that's what infectious disease doctors do. But the truth is um, we are able to offer them some knowledge about what we see in respiratory viruses and then any new knowledge we're getting about COVID-19. But the really special thing is we are able to learn from these patients. And I think to become an expert in something, you really have to watch the clinical course of patients. So I'm gonna tell you about what's happened with some of our patients and I've kind of split this into three phases because it's interesting how we've seen trends with our patients. So. The first week, the first group of patients we saw, this is a good example, a 73-year-old female with Crohn's disease who presented with cough, fever, chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, and vomiting. She was pretty darn sick. Um, her exposure risk is that she'd traveled to Paris recently and then New York City and had flown back with her husband. And he was sick as well with very different symptoms. He just had a severe headache and extreme fatigue, but he'd also lost taste and smell. So um, talking to these patients, the, the first thing that I picked up on that is, was very common during this time is that it was incredibly scary. I would say most of the patients I talked to really thought there was a good chance they were going to die because all they really knew of COVID is what they were seeing on the news. And a lot of these patients were older and had comorbidities. Um, and, and so it was, it was a scary time for them. Um, the other thing I, I realize is that really the reason we were able to diagnose COVID in these patients is because they had traveled, because at this point there were very few tests. And so a lot of patients who had similar symptoms couldn't get their test results. But again, this group um, was scared and it took a lot of reassurance and, and we went through a lot together. In fact, most of the patients I saw during this first week, I, I still see occasionally to check in with them. So then the next group starting in about April to June were the group I will call the essential workers and their families. So um, one example is this, a 32 year old female with hypertension who worked at a grocery store. So her symptoms when I saw her were muscle aches, headache, cough, and again, loss of taste and smell. But look at this list of household members. So her father had tested positive for COVID and was in the ICU at a local hospital with respiratory failure. Her mother had severe fatigue and fever. Her daughter had no symptoms, son no symptoms, and her younger daughter had fever just for a day, but the kids were fine. So this was an example of how we were treating not only the patient um, and her own illness, but dealing with the stress she was under with her family being sick. And in fact, her mother, when I asked her about how her mother was doing, it sounded like she was doing pretty poorly. So like we often do with patients, I said, well, could she be our patient also? Can I give her a call? So I called her mother. I mean, this is in the house, the same house, but I talked to her mother and her mother hadn't gotten out of bed literally for a day um, and hadn't used the bathroom for a day. So I sent her to the emergency room. So sometimes with this group, we were treating not only the patient, but their families. During this period, we had a lot of patients who lived east and south um, San Diego County and in Imperial County. Um, there were a lot of patients who lived with multiple members um, of family in their household, multiple generations, sometimes as many as four generations, often close quarters. And they had jobs where they couldn't work from home and someone had to make money. So that's part of where the risk came from. We had a large Spanish speaking population, over 50% a lot of these weeks. And luckily we were able to have one of our fellows who's fluent in Spanish 
see these patients with us. And that was amazing. She did all the talking, all the reassurance, and we attendings stayed on the phone call with her. So that was, that was very important. Then we hit a new phase. Around the end of June, our patients suddenly got much younger and COVID seemed to move west. And this is a good example of the patients we started to see. So a 17 year old female with no medical problems. So her exposure risk was that her brother just tested positive for COVID. But I asked her a little bit about what she'd been up to. So she'd gone to the beach three times in the last week with groups of friends, no masks, and they boogie boarded. And I asked if they stayed far away from each other. And she was honest, she said, no, not really. She'd had a slumber party three days earlier with seven friends. And her parents also were socializing. And when their friends came over for the slumber party, all of the parents were also hanging out, no masks, no distance. And so definitely a lot of risk for getting COVID. Symptoms, none. She felt totally fine. And for her household members, they, her mother had no symptoms. Her dad had just developed mild symptoms and her brother had described his symptoms as having a hangover, but he'd lost taste and smell and that's why he'd been tested. So the few things I noticed with this group, um, they weren't very scared. Uh, and, and I think part of it was they weren't getting very sick. So she, there was not the alarm that I felt with the first group or the second group. It was kind of like, ah, yeah, I have it, but that's okay. Um, and then the other issues were, I, I think that there was a loss of understanding of quarantine. So during this time, oh, people could get tests very readily. And so what was interesting is the mother who tested negative and the father, they tested negative days earlier yet they didn't think they needed to quarantine anymore. And so I had to explain the idea of quarantine and that you can turn positive any time over the 14 days. But I think that was an added danger. They almost got a false sense of security by getting a negative test. So this was a very eye-opening group. And um, it was easy for me to understand why COVID spread so rapidly um, in San Diego. And I'm gonna show you our numbers and, and what happened in our infectious disease clinic. So this graph shows um, our usual volume in our MOS infectious disease clinic. So January and February and most of March is just our general ID patients. You can see that once we started doing the COVID-19 clinic at the end of March, how our numbers increased per month. So we, in July, we saw 571 patients versus 78 in January. So we have at this point seen um, 573 COVID patients, positive patients for over 1300 visits. We've only had 13 patients hospitalized, only three of which are in the ICU. And so far, all of our patients have recovered, even if they went to the hospital, we've had no deaths. So I think these numbers are part of why my job is um, a little bit easier in the sense that most of our outpatients do generally well. So we have learned a lot from our patients. I think the number one is that it's very scary to have COVID-19, no matter how well you're doing. Um, a lot of the patients who even were not feeling that sick had a great deal of anxiety. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is a real thing, especially in healthcare workers. Um, so we're dealing with that a whole lot and trying to add some um, reassurance and comfort for these patients. The clinical course of COVID-19 varies greatly. We see a whole lot of different symptoms. We see the progression can be very different between patients. It's just not very predictable. Most outpatients with COVID-19 recover and do well. And then the real important thing that I've learned is that we all need to be good citizens to protect each other from COVID-19. And I think this is essential, especially when we're talking about schools opening up. Um, in order to protect other people, we have to be careful of our own behaviors. We cannot just look at how COVID-19 will affect us or our families individually. And so uh, we obviously learned a whole lot from these patients and continue to learn every day, but the real goal of this clinic is to help the patients. And so these are some comments that patients have left. Um, he puts me at ease. Her energy brings us peace. We were sad about a lot of things that were happening. My brother died, but for the first time in a month, we were able to sleep after talking to her. And then this final one, like a comforting hand on my shoulder, the fear of not knowing what to expect or how bad I could get or whether I would die if I got worse and had to be hospitalized evaporated. So I hope this is showing that, that we did our job a little bit. So my final thoughts. So my husband wears this UCSD shirt around the house that says teamwork makes the dream work. And I really think that's true. Um, throughout COVID-19, we've seen some great examples of people coming together and really doing wonderful things. 
Um, taking ownership of a patient's care has benefits in itself. And I truly believe this. I think that um, we offer a lot to patients just by being a doctor for them and showing them that we are there for them and they can contact us in their moments of need. And the final thing is our patients are our greatest teachers. I've learned so much from the patients that I've seen in this clinic. I know my colleagues agree, and, and I'm so grateful and honored that they've let us be part of their journey um, of having COVID-19. So my team, so this was certainly not done on my own. I have an amazing group of people that I've worked with and, and we get along great and meet weekly. So Kathy Bordeaux in the center is my, uh, our nurse manager in ID and she's my partner in the OPAP program. And when I told her about this clinic, she just said, sure, great, like she always does. And immediately had set up a scheduling protocol, a database for the patients, she's been amazing. Then we have all of our physicians, Dr. Barty, Dr. Horton, Dr. Jenks, um, Dr. Aslam, um, Dr. Lee. All of these doctors picked up sessions of this clinic on top of their usual clinic, clinical duties. So, so it, it was quite a sacrifice. And then we had Andrea Ramsey, our fellow who helped us out, and Diana Paddock, our new, I say RN, I'm so sorry, PA, who's been amazing. And then Marissa, our scheduler. I also have my mom at the bottom. So like many working parents right now, one of the challenges in doing our jobs is that our kids have been sent home from school. So my mother happened to be visiting us from Michigan in um, March when COVID hit and she stayed on. And so while I was able to spend my days trying to treat COVID, she had the much more difficult job of homeschooling my three children. So she's been an essential part of my team. So I wanted to make sure to give her some credit. And Joe in the center is our wonderful nurse who we were just so lucky to get. Um, we asked for a nurse and the float team sent us Joe and he is amazing with patients. Um, many patients said to me, Joe saved my life just by those daily phone calls. The other neat thing he did is he would ask every patient for a song for his COVID-19 playlist. And this is the playlist. This is not all the patient's songs, but these are the only ones I could fit on a, um, on a slide. And there's lots of great ones. Um, I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor ended up uh, multiple times. Um, when the Going Gets Rough is on there. And even Baby Shark. I I think a lot of parents chose that as their song. So I will leave you with this and thank you so much for your time and, and the chance to talk with you. And I think next we're gonna hear from Dan Sweeney from the ICU. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, Dan. Bear with me one moment. Okay, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Michelle, thanks for that great description of the outpatient experience. I've been tasked with the um, job of giving you the view from the ICU. Uh, during this pandemic. And I thought I would start with a little bit of irony. So this is actually the view from one of our ICU rooms. And this is a healthcare wor worker looking out the window of ICU room three. And what you can see in the background is a cruise ship. So interestingly, even when you were looking outside of the, even if you were facing outside the ICU from the ICU, you were reminded of COVID. After all, early on the pandemic, many of our early patients um, were a result of these cruise ships in our harbor. So I thought, thought I would begin by showing you some hard numbers, show you the, the work that has been done, the heavy lifting, and also the relative success that we've experienced. The data I'm going to show you comes to us brought to you by Chad Vandenberg and his group. And I'll tell you the data begins uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and extends all the way until just a few days ago. And the first thing I want you to realize is that we've had 176 admissions to our two medical ICUs, the one at Hillcrest and the one at Jacobs. And our survival rate, again, the majority of our patients survive. Our ICU survival rate is about 74%. We've had 123 mechanically ventilated patients. And while our survival rate is a little bit less, it's still pretty impressive at nearly 70%. For those patients who become particularly uh, sick uh, and require ECMO, and for those of you who don't know what ECMO is, it's essentially a lung machine. Um, and this is a service that is provided at Jacobs only. 
and it's provided by a really remarkable team and they've taken care of 24 patients. This number clearly represents the largest number of patients receiving ECMO in San Diego. And again, their survival rate is, is really extraordinary. This is better than most of the survival rates that you'll see reported. And that goes uh, also for our overall ICU survival rate and also for our survival rate for mechanically ventilated patients. This slide is intentionally blank because I wanna be careful about um, over-interpreting or um, um, placing too much confidence in this data. Remember, we are a, rel you know, relative to some of the other data sets out there, we represent a small amount of the COVID outbreak. Mostly comparator studies are in the ranges of, of a few thousand patients and they pool patients from tens of ICUs. So I'm proud of the fact that the numbers I just showed you are uh, better than the national averages. Um, I just caution you about over-interpreting that data. And this really leads us nicely into this study that was recently published in JAMA, and then it was, uh, the findings were echoed in this New York Times article, opinion piece entitled, if I hadn't been transferred, I would have died. And this really speaks to our role as an institution during this pandemic. Uh, in this article, they looked at roughly 2,000 patients from approximately 60 ICUs. And what they found was when they divided those ICUs into small ICUs, or, or excuse me, hospital systems that had fewer ICUs or, or more ICU beds, basically small hospital systems versus large hospital systems, it was found that you were three times more likely to die with COVID if you were admitted to a smaller hospital. Now, I wanna be clear here. I don't mean to say anything disparaging about small hospital systems. God knows I've worked in many of an, many of an ICU in a community hospital over the years, and I recognize that they do really the lion's share of critical care across this country. But there's a reason why academic centers like, like ours exist, and this has been shown across other diseases, for example, ARDS, where the outcomes are better at an academic center probably because of the experience from top to bottom, uh, the resources we have, so on and so forth. And to this end, I think we should be proud of the fact that our system stepped up and we accepted and have, had, and have accepted 88 patients during this pandemic from other hospitals who, according to the data I just showed you, certainly had a better chance of surviving by coming to us. So what is COVID care like in the ICU? Well, it really begins with good supportive care, that's what critical care is. And this should not be minimized. What separates an average ICU from an exemplary ICU is really how well we do the little things. These patients stay in our ICU typically on average longer than other cohorts of critically ill patients. And so it's very important to avoid the things that can get these patients in trouble. Hospital acquired infections, skin breakdowns, so on and so forth. And this is something we do exceptionally well. Also, at the end of the day, when a patient comes to the ICU with COVID disease, first and foremost, this is a respiratory disease, and it really requires expert ventilatory management, which really our Division of Pulmonary Critical Care has provided. I'd also like to mention prone positioning and prone ventilation. So for some of you who are not familiar with what this is, basically patients who are extremely hypoxic, we will take these patients and turn them, instead of having them receiving mechanical ventilation on their back and have them receive mechanical ventilation while lying on their stomach. This approach uh, was popularized uh, uh, in, the, in the care of ARD, ARDS patients. It's shown benefit and it's been applied widely to uh, COVID patients. This is no small undertaking. I can tell you I've worked at hospitals where proning a patient has resulted in the patient having a cardiac arrest. And what's really remarkable is, is, is how well and how simple it looks like it's done when, when patients uh, are prone at both of our ICUs. But again, it's labor intensive. As you can see, there's at least a minimum of five healthcare workers. Why is it so complicated? Well, there's lots of things going on simultaneously. This patient's receiving renal replacement therapy. You just cannot have these cannula um, uh, accidentally uh, dislodged. Of course, they're also on mechanically ventilate. They're also being mechanically ventilated, and you can see there's a respiratory therapist 
at the head of the bed holding onto that tube for dear life, making sure it doesn't become dislodged. And again, I point to the window. This is an early morning shot. This is happening day and night for some of our patients twice a day. Surveillance of co-infections has been a very important part of the care of COVID patients in the ICU. So approximately 10% of critically ill patients will have a co-infection, either coming in with that co-infection or acquired in the hospital. And a, a good portion of our day and, and our workup for these patients is ruling out those infections when they come in and preventing infections from being acquired. Updating families. This could be a talk true, truly onto itself. It's been an incredible challenge during these times. Um, it's it's uh, something that has given a lot of us pause and uh, at times almost felt inhumane. At the beginning of this, this pandemic, the standard of care across the country was no visitors in the hospital. And so this became a real challenge for us. We had to be the eyes and ears of our patients, loved ones and, and update them. And our, our team spends a great deal of time doing this, whether it's old fashioned phone calls, Zoom meetings. Um, and then of course, when under certain circumstances, um, when patients, if they're towards the end of life, for example, we will do everything we can to get families at the bedside and be as, as humane as possible. But again, this continues to be a challenge for us. If a patient becomes so sick that they require a lung machine, then they've been receiving this treatment, as I've already mentioned, up at Jacobs. And, and I've seen ECMO done at many centers, and I've never seen ECMO provided like it's provided here at Jacobs. And what I'm showing you here is a picture of a patient who is being mobilized uh, and receiving physical therapy. These patients who are on ECMO oftentimes will be on ECMO for weeks. And I can't imagine what their outcomes would be without this kind of intensive physical, th physical therapy. And again, it, it, it's, a, it's a large team that's required to do this. And all of this, everything I've mentioned, you know, has been done while patients, excuse me, while healthcare workers have been donning and doffing PPE. I think though, I've told you what COVID care is, I think it's equally important to describe what we didn't do. During this pandemic, there was a great push to provide compassionate medicines off-label as compassionate care. And, and our institution really took the standpoint that that wasn't compassionate care, but was rather panic care. And we did our best to, be, to avoid being tempted by giving unproven therapies outside of a clinical trial. So the first of these drugs was hydroxychloroquine. This is something that, and again, I'm, I'm so proud of our ID group and our critical care group working together and saying, no, we're not going to uh, prescribe this medicine outside of a clinical trial. And you know, we'll never know, looking back, there were a lot of early deaths, a lot of cardiac arrests, which we're not seeing now. Uh, that could be attributed to some of these experimental th therapies. Um, and, and our decision not to provide hydroxychloroquine compassionately was ultimately supported by the FDA. The same with Kaletra. This was a drug that was, that was being uh, proposed for treatment of COVID. And once again, no benefit. We've continued to resist the urge to give therapeutic anticoagulation solely on the basis of COVID disease. This is always tricky in the ICU, trying to stop antibiotics. So we do, as, and antibiotic stewardship is a huge part of the care of COVID patients. So doing our best to look under every stone, so to speak, for an infection. And once we're confident we don't have a secondary infection, uh, we stop antibiotics. I think also really, really key to this approach has been the COVID clinical trial committee led by Connie Benson, which has worked hard to vet potential clinical trials, or as we say, avoid some of these boutique drug trials that are proposed to our institution on a daily basis that offer a drug that is oftentimes uh, has not been well studied. And uh, if we were to accept all of these trials, we would be diverting our, our, our attention and our efforts from the cares that we know really work. And this approach was summed up in a recent editorial by two of my colleagues, and I think the title says it all, addressing the, what do we have to lose? Just give the drug rationale, making the case for clinical trials instead of off-label use. So our division has also been working beyond the brick and mortar of our two hospitals. We've provided telemedicine coverage to El Centro. 
I find this picture from the Wall Street Journal to be quite interesting. It was a expose on the care being provided to the patients in El Centro. And if you look closely at the reflection in the glass of this patient's room, you will see Dr. Ramnath, one of our critical care doctors providing telemedicine to this patient. Again, a beautiful, a beautiful image of, of how telemedicine is working behind the scenes to help take care of these folks. Also led by uh, Dr. Jess Mandel and, and Dr. Tim Morris, we've provided expert, expert uh, teaching and guidance in terms of how to care for COVID patients to Tijuana General Hospital. In terms of what have we done for science? Well, we've provided and, and really added to the body of scholarship on this disease. There's been multiple ICU-based studies. This is a study from largely supported by the Gilbert lab, lab and largely led by one of our fellows, uh, Dr. Farhana Ali, looking at COVID in the environment. This is a study uh, that Dr. Mazen Odish was a part of looking at proning patients who aren't intubated. But what I'd really like to focus on is, is this trial. This, this was really a landmark trial, both in the course of this pandemic, but I also think it was quite an accomplishment for our system as a whole and, and it would not have happened without the leadership and guidance of Dr. Connie Benson, and there's a full stop there. Um, this trial that I'm talking about was the ACT-1 trial, which looked at remdesivir versus placebo. We were one of 73 centers around the world one of 45 US sites. And this was the first trial during the pandemic to show a medicine that was targeted for COVID that, that was beneficial to patients with COVID. And it was published in the New England Journal. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you about the 25, roughly 25% 25 of patients who don't make it. This, was an, this is the wedding photo from roughly 50, 60 years ago of two of our patients who came in early during the pandemic from uh, the El Centro region. They came in, they both had COVID. And unfortunately, the husband survived and the wife did not. And um, you know, I'm always impressed with how families are able to, to you know, stay together and to work through these, these hard times and to even spend the time to thank us for the care that we provided and to wish us well. But again, lastly, I, I think it's more important to leave you with hope. If, if you're admitted to the ICU or one of your, your loved ones are admitted to our ICU, the chances of survival are roughly 70%. So the majority of our patients truly do come back from COVID as this sort of ICU nurse graffiti speaks to. In fact, here is the husband that I just mentioned on his way home. Here's another patient who, who sent me this picture via my phone with the caption, look what's missing, doc. So this was a patient who had COVID, was requiring mechanical ventilation, required a tracheostomy, and he sends me a picture showing me how his tracheostomy has been removed, and now he's home and, and back to baseline. A great story. And finally, I'd like to share some gratitude and respect across a variety of services. Um, you know, John Wooden, the former UCLA basketball coach was fond of saying, sports do not build character, they reveal character. And I respectfully like to paraphrase that quote by saying, a pandemic does not build character, it too reveals character. And I've seen character. I've seen our internal medicine house staff volunteer to uh, work in our ICU or provide uh, or participate in research of COVID disease. Some of these, you know, in one case, one of our house staff uh, did this instead of, you know, taking his vacation. Our consultants, this is a neurologist, Dr. Gertsch, who I, for the first time, met during, during this pandemic. Early on the pandemic, it was scary times. People were nervous about coming to our ICU, and he showed up, and I was so happy to see him. As a, as a consultant. And so I started to tell him my physical exam and he, he held up his hand and said, thanks, but I'm a doctor and I'm, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna see that patient. I'm gonna take care of that patient. These are the kinds of people you wanna work with during a pandemic. Can't say enough about my critical care colleagues who I haven't mentioned already. Uh, the amount of, of work, the volunteerism to take on extra shifts, to really deal with the sickest of, of the sick patients from this COVID disease. 
But finally, I'd like to speak to the ICU staffs at both hospitals. And I can't take a picture of everyone as Dr. Kane mentioned, so I'm gonna just highlight one. This is Lupe, who's one of our clinical care partners. If you're a sports fan, she is a super utility infielder in baseball terminology. She effectively plays shortstop, second base, and catcher all in the same game. You need equipment, can't find something, go to Lupe. You need to move a patient, go to Lupe. And she's really emblematic of the kind of people I've had really the privilege to work with. Early in this pandemic, we didn't know if, our, if we were wearing the proper PPE. And each day it was seemingly changing based on, on the recommendations coming from the CDC. But people like Lupe and the rest of our staff just continue to do their job. And, and, and that's really the highest compliment you can say during a pandemic. And so with that, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Chris. Dr. Sweeney, thank you very much. And I wanna say uh, thank you to uh, all three of our presenters so far. Um, we're going to uh, move on to the Q&A section of our um, uh, panel today. And uh, I think Dr. Kane, you're gonna start with some questions for uh, critical care nurse Moss. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And again, uh, Dr. Ritter and Dr. Sweeney, those presentations were fantastic. So uh, critical care nurse Moss, tell us uh, what it's like um, trying to communicate with families during the pandemic. Dr. Sweeney mentioned uh, that, but I know I've cared for elderly parents and I've completely haunted their, their uh, care teams, uh, probably harassing them uh, when they're hospitalized. So uh, how do you manage that in this environment? Yeah. Um, so, you know, in the beginning nationwide, the visitor policy was that there are no visitors. This was a whole new world for us. We had to work through policies. We had to talk to different stakeholders in order to create something that made sense for us at the time. It wasn't perfect in the beginning and it still isn't perfect, but really we believe that we have the most liberal visitor policy compared to other hospital policies that I've seen anyway. Um, and it's really hard for us on nurses as well, because we're trying to bridge that gap and be the support system for both families over the telephone throughout the day and our patients. So we're holding their hand, we're reassuring them that they're safe, we're doing everything we can to take care of them. And we're updating them that their loved one called, we pass along messages, we try our best to set up FaceTime or Zoom calls as well so that people at least can see their loved ones. Um, either way, we make an effort to reach out to families every single day, and especially during end of life or extreme circumstances, we do everything we can to get families there at the bedside. Let me just follow up with that. We're talking about families, and I know that you've been in the ICU, you know, essentially every shift that you've had during the pandemic. But yet at the end of the day, you have to go home. How, are you been, how have you been managing your own sense of personal risk and managing the sense that you may be putting your family members at risk? Well, you know, um, when we used to come into work, it just used to be about work. And now when we come into work, it's, there's really a huge focus on PPE as well so that we don't infect ourselves, so that we don't infect others, and so that we don't spread this disease. We even change into hospital scrubs provided to our unit specifically, um, and those scrubs stay on the unit. They don't, they don't come home with us. So, um, you know, nurses are spending hours within six feet of someone who is known to have COVID disease. We do this every day, and we have been doing this every day since March. Um, and so when we go home, we have no doubt in our mind whether or not we interacted with someone with COVID today. We did. We know we did. So there is a lot of uncertainty going home and it's a much more controlled welcome home. You know, we're not rushing into the arms of our families upon our arrival. My husband knows he's not allowed to touch me until I change, wash up. Um, you know, in the beginning, he would meet me out by our garage and I would, I would change outside because I didn't know much about COVID and or what I was introducing into our home. We discussed living in different rooms, um, but ultimately decided that we were in this together and we were going to be until we had information to tell us otherwise. That support really has made it possible for me to stay strong mentally and to keep fighting this disease every day at work. 
um, especially with all of our other coping mechanisms for the most part closed, like, you know, gyms, yoga studios, massage, things like that. So right now the love and support of our families and friends really means the world to all of us. Katie, um, just a couple of questions in terms of, um, you know, one of the things that I think we feel really good about is the amount of testing we've been able to do. And, and um, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how you all have participated in testing and how that makes you feel um, relative to coming into the units um, and the safety of the units themselves. Absolutely. So I know I myself has been, have been tested six times, um, partly for clinical trials, um, partly just, you know, our, our standard hospital testing um, for the ICUs. And I know that each time I get that negative result and knowing how much time I've spent in these rooms with patients known to have COVID really has made me feel more comfortable. So that transition from me changing into the garage now isn't as intense coming home because I feel a sense of comfort. And I know some, sometimes I think I'm almost more safe because I know that there's someone in front of me with COVID, but I also have all of the PPE that I need to stay safe. Um, so those negative tests that keep coming in really are, are slowly making us feel a little bit more comfortable that all of our PPE really is working. and there's very little people that I know that I work with in our ICU that has tested positive and most of them have been attributed more to community exposure. Is there something, if you were to think about what you would want the community to know about you and your coworkers and, you know, just your overall um, mental state and sense of optimism, you know, what you would what you would want the community to really understand about, uh, about how you all are feeling about the work that you do? I think for me, every time I see something on the news where there's a large group gathering, um, I start to get nervous because I tend to see a trend about two weeks later that we get busier. So really just, I, I know how difficult it is. I don't get a break from COVID. I come to work and I, you know, COVID is in my face. I come home and everything is closed and I'm aware of COVID then too. So we don't, we don't get a break from COVID. I know how difficult it is and how hard it is to hang in there during this time, but just asking everyone to wear a mask, wash your hands, try your best to, to stay home and, and follow the rules and, and regulations that, you know, are provided to us so that everyone can stay safe and, and that COVID can end hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but just also knowing that if you do end up in our ICU, you really are in excellent hands. Um, and, and, and like Dr. Sweeney spoke to, our survival rates are very, very high. Um, so I, I hope that they can find some comfort in that. Thank you, Katie, for all that you and your team are doing. Thank you. We have an audience uh, question here, um, and a reminder, if you're joining us live, the Minty code is in the YouTube uh, description. So one of our audience members asks, uh, actually says, thank you so much for all of your hard work on the front lines. Two questions. How has COVID-19 changed your perspective on medicine, and what changes do you expect to see in the healthcare system post-COVID-19? So uh, Chris, Shelley, and um, Dan and Katie, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'll just mention the second part of that question, how do I think our system will change? Um, I, I definitely think telehealth is here to stay. Uh, we'd done about 800 telehealth visits before COVID. Now we do over a thousand a day. Uh, we trained essentially all of our faculty, 25% of our ambulatory visits are now telehealth. And there's some programs that are 90% telehealth. So it really taught us how to use telehealth and that's I think here to stay. I think the other thing that we'll take away from COVID is the sense of teamwork and improved communications. So I, I think our physician newsletter, the chiefs and chairs updates, the town halls, people, the most common compliment I hear is they appreciate the frequent communication, both our faculty and staff. So I, I think our communication enhancement is something else that we'll take away from, from the pandemic and we'll, comp we'll continue those best practices. From my vantage point, I would also piggyback on to what Chris said. Interestingly, in terms of the medical education, the Zoom lectures and Zoom conferences that I've had a, an opportunity to uh, listen in on from literally around the world 
uh, from my house have been amazing. And I think this is going to revolutionize. And, and again, I'm a positive person. I think this is going to revolutionize how, how we learn both in our hospital uh, and outside of our hospital. And the other thing that I'm reminded of during this pandemic is the importance of relying on doing what you know you do well and not and avoiding that temptation to just do something. Um, I think in, in the midst of a pandemic, you've got to pause and you've got to focus on, on the things that, that you do well, the skills that you know work and be very cautious in terms of moving forward with experimental therapies. And I think that's really been sort of the theme of the care that we've provided. M Michelle, uh, Dr. Ritter, I see a, a question about how do you explain the low hospitalization rate of the over 500 patients you've been caring for? Do you have a perspective about that? Well, I, I don't think it's any specific intervention we're doing. I think hopefully our clinic decreased unnecessary visits to the hospital. I think sometimes when people are panicking and feel alone at recovering from an illness, the first inkling is to go to an urgent care or emergency room. But I, I think it's probably more of a reflection of the fact that um, a lot of patients do do okay with COVID. Um, you know, generally there are a lot of people out there don't even know they have it um, and that have very mild symptoms. And we were seeing patients who found out incidentally that they had it, meaning they got tested before going to visit grandma or they were about to have a medical procedure and got tested. So it gives me a lot of hope at the fact that we had such low um, hospitalization rates. But again, I think it's just a reflection of the disease itself and that there are a lot of people who do do okay. But the, the big issue is not everyone does. And so we've all got to be very careful about, about getting the disease. Ritter, I have a follow-up question on that, which is that uh, there'd been some excitement initially about the idea of home oxygen saturation monitoring. We actually had a clinical trial with one of our uh, primary care groups um, but uh, what I heard you described is that it's really more about the home symptom monitoring. Can you comment on the, the difference? Yeah. So, you know, it's a tricky symptom to discuss with patients, um, shortness of breath, simply because it's, it's the one indication to go to the hospital that, that everybody knows about. But a lot of patients are anxious. And, and so when you say to them, you know, let me know if you feel short of breath and say, I think I might've felt short of breath yesterday. When you think about breathing, you often can feel kind of short of breath. So where I think for us, oxygen monitoring has really come in handy are those cases where someone probably is okay, but needs the reassurance because there's so much anxiety with patients with COVID. We've had um, a lot of patients who've gotten their own home O2 monitors on Amazon or something like that. And, and my only concern with that is, I don't know how great they all are. So it's not that I'm asking for them to record their oxygen saturation and let me know. It's more of a tool, again, if they're having a moment where they're scared, you know, middle of the night, they wake up, they have a coughing spell and want some reassurance, I, I tell them to use it. But generally, we just talk about how short of breath are you? When you're talking, are you having a hard time catching your breath? Are you going up the stairs? Is it that just shortness of breath with that? But the main thing I, I tell patients is, you know, if you have to go to the emergency room, it's okay. Because I think a lot of people are so frightened that if they go to the hospital, they're never gonna leave the hospital. And so I do want them to know that if you really are, you know, really having symptoms, I, I tell them to have their family member look at them. I said, ask, ask your wife, does she, does she think you look short of breath? And if so, maybe go to the emergency room. You know, if you're doing fine, they'll send you back home. But it, it's a tricky thing. But again, from my experience, the, the O2 saturation machines are just real helpful in those moments where um, if someone needs a little more information to let them know what they should do. Well, Shelley, two weeks ago, we had uh, uh, doctors Edwards and Maldonado talking about AIDS uh, or about COVID and pediatrics. Um, you've been uh, working with uh, local school systems about getting the schools open. And you've also been seeing this younger age group who seem to be a little bit less um, anxious about aid about COVID than some of the than we wish they were. Do you have any advice to us about um, how to instill a little more respect for the disease and people who are fueling the epidemic? Oh my goodness. Yes. I think this is a really big challenge. Um, you know, you you realize that these patients know they're not gonna maybe get that sick from it. So to get them to understand the importance of not spreading it is tough, especially because younger people and even their parents understand the importance of socializing and getting out there and being with friends. But 
it's sad, but part of me feels like the reason this group is having um, a hard time understanding is they're not seeing the really bad cases in their own family members versus our patients who are living in close quarters of family members. So I think it's just getting that message out there that your actions or your behavior, even if, if you get it and you don't think you're going to get that sick, you've got to think of the bigger picture and you've got to think of that complete stranger down the line who may be in the ICU because you decided to go to a slumber party or you decided to let your kid go to the beach with 10 friends and not wear masks. Everything, every action we have um, can have an impact down the line. And, and from a parenting standpoint, I think it's difficult because a lot of parenting is that you worry about your own child and your, your own risks and you kind of respect people's decisions about their children and what they allow them to do. But in a pandemic, the actions, the things you allow your child to do, the risky behaviors that you allow um, is affecting everybody. And so you've got to think outside yourself and your own family and your own kids. And, and that's a challenge. But I think if schools are to open, um, we can make things as safe as we possibly want in schools. We can have everyone wear masks and keep distance and go outside. But if the minute kids leave school, they go and socialize with their friends without masks or go to an activity where masks aren't allowed, it's just going to keep spreading. So we've got to realize it is our duty to be doing these behaviors everywhere if we want to keep schools open or get schools open even. Dr. Ritter, uh, thank you for those uh, comments. And uh, I wanted to say thank you again to our entire team today. Um, really terrific presentations and uh, excited that this will be uh, recorded and available to all of our team members afterwards. Also want to um, plug our uh, final summer series Grand Rounds next week, where uh, Dr. Del Rio from Emory and Dr. Wilder from uh, Duke will be joining us to discuss COVID-19 and healthcare disparities. So thank you again for a terrific day today and uh, hope you have a great Wednesday. Thank you.